Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world. And I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. The crucifixion of Jesus, whom we see as the Son of God, was a devastating prophecy that humans will sooner kill God than change themselves. Yet, the God-man suffers our rejection willingly, so something bigger can happen. Richard Rohr. A completely good God, whose nature is pure love, produces people who imitate him by exemplifying love. That God, who willingly laid down his life for others, inspires loving followers who truly are free, free to move beyond the slavery of self-seeking into self-giving, sacrificial love. Brad Jersek. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to you here in Oakville, to those that are watching online, uh, to our uh, distance and our uh, uh, other sites that are checking in. Welcome. He's risen. risen We can still say that, even though it's not Easter, right? Like that's that truth still applies, uh, which is an encouragement to me. This is this is a brand new series. We're starting the week one. We'll be doing three weeks, and in in many ways, it's kind of a uh, um, a culmination or uh, the fruition of what we've been talking about last week in Easter Easter Sunday and Good Friday, and even what we've been talking about uh, in. the last month of Leviticus. And it's, it's, a, it's a culmination, a fruition of this idea of the sacrificial savior and the importance of the sacrifice that Jesus made for each and every one of us. Uh, Leviticus, we spent uh, most of our time or a lot of our time talking about sacrifices and the importance of sacrifices. In the next three weeks, we're gonna just dig in a little bit on, uh, on what the implication is, what that means for us. Uh, next week, we'll be getting, getting to hear from Jimmy. We'll be talking about what that sacrificial life will look like. And then our final week, the third week, we'll get to hear from Laura taking us through some uh, sacrificial practices and how this works out. We'll be talking about uh, how in the Old Testament we see a sacrificial system and how that system evolves beautifully with an invitation for us to live a sacrificial life, which is different from the ways of our world. So the death and resurrection of Jesus is actually the demonstration of God loving us and inviting us to be the best version of ourselves. 
to be free from sin that hurts our relationships and to be an unstoppable force of good in our world. And that we're filled to do this by the love of God and the Spirit of God. That's good news for us. So I want to uh, highlight, go back in time a little bit to what we, some of the, the two of the, the things uh, that came from our talk in Leviticus. And one is that God's people were rescued from slavery in Egypt. We talked about that, right? That was, that was a, a, a big piece of our Leviticus. And to all of those that were um, very concerned for my well-being that I've never seen the Ten Commandments before, I appreciate the invitations for watch parties and to spend the time. I still haven't seen it. I did, I did attempt, I think it was on Saturday, and I got about a half an hour in and realized, okay, I'm going to have to do this in shifts because it's like, it's like five hours long, the movie, right? Like it's re- no, maybe not that long. Four hours. Three hours? It's pretty long. So, so, I, so rest assured, um, one of your, you know, my salvation is intact. Uh, I will watch it. I will be uh, one of you eventually, but it may take me some time. But we... We, we talked about the, the rescue and the exit from Egypt and how miraculous that was, but the really hard work, the hard work that continues to this day isn't just getting, Egypt, getting the people out of Egypt, but getting Egypt out of the people. And, and when, I, when I'm talking about Egypt, I'm not talking about a, a particular country or a place or a people. Um, some of my good friends are Egyptian. I'm not talking about... Uh, Egypt as being a, this, this bad place, but what it represents as far as the Old Testament is when I talk about Egypt, I'm talking about um, the predominant or major way uh, the dominant civilizations have seen things and continue to operate. So, so we talk about Egypt, or we can talk about Babylon, or we can talk about Rome, we can talk about certain aspects of, of our Western culture and society. It's a, it's a mindset, it's a, it's a way of approaching and looking at the world. It's a way of empire. So some of the characteristics of empire, this is, this is, just a, this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the things that would de- define and say, okay, this is a part of, we're in empire, would be, would be force, would be fear, uh, violence, greed, this idea of scarcity, that there, there isn't enough to go around, that somehow I need, to, I need to take as much as I can and hold on to it. That ties into this, this concept of territory. It's like once I have my space, no one comes in, no one goes out, and, and actually I want to try and expand my territory. My, my influence would be another characteristic. My desire for control. These are all uh, attributes and characteristics of worldly power, of empire. When we talk about getting Egypt out of us, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. God is trying to introduce to us a new countercultural way of living that goes against the ways of Egypt and Rome and Babylon and the West. And this countercultural way of living is marked by love, by compassion, by empathy, other centeredness, by faith, self sacrifice. These, these are the markers of this countercultural movement. So when we're talking about getting Egypt out of the people, we're talking about adopting a whole new way of living, of rejecting the way of force and coercion and adopting love and other centeredness. And maybe you, you, you hear these two kingdoms put side by side, and we think, yeah, ideally, we look, okay, yes, and I, uh, you know, a, a kingdom of love and empathy and all of these things, that sounds great on paper. I love the idea of these things, but in actuality, when I look at the way that I live my life or the way that I engage, it's, um, it's very different from that. Actually, when I look at the first list, this idea of kingdom, this is the one that resonates most with the way that I, where I live and I move. But God's desire is to help his people. Help his people and those that want to follow him in a real way exchange this way of living for another way, a better way, a more fulfilling way. 
So that's the first piece, God's desire of wanting to, to get Egypt out of his people. And the second one is that God is trying to get close. He's trying to close the gap, the distance between himself and his creation. There's, there's space in between, and God is continually trying to shrink that distance. We read about that in, um, in our study in Leviticus, that God starts as the God of the mountain, where he's up on high, and only Moses has access. He's able to get to him, and it's a lot of fear and trembling when uh, Moses approaches him. But God then says, no, 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 I want to come down from the mountain and be amongst the people, where there be, there's... there's plans for this tabernacle or this dwelling place for God to be amongst his children. And that it's not just Moses, now it moves towards Aaron and the Levites so that the scope of God's connectedness is increasing. More people have access to him. God's wanting to close the distance between us that exists. And ultimately, he does this. We, we Celebrated this last week. The closing of the gap is made complete in the teaching, in the life, in the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And is experienced in real life and in real time through God's community. God's new dwelling place, his new tabernacle which is within us, his body, his church. We'll read that uh, passage again in uh, Corinthian, or sorry, Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse, uh, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, of us, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once we were alienated from God and were enemies, in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free of accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. If you can't say amen, my goodness. That's some, that's some good news. That's some good news. And when we go to the scriptures, um, anytime we, we go there, sometimes we can get frustrated as to why this is a big deal. Why is it that some people get really excited and enthusiastic about this? Does this even really matter? Because we can sometimes be discouraged that the good news can feel like too good to be true news. You mean I'm not required to do anything? A few verses before this, uh, Paul says that you've, in, you've inherited, that God has qualified you through no work of your own, through no sacrifice that you had to produce, for no anything that you had to muster up. God says that you're qualified to be one of his, to inherit this kingdom of light and leave a kingdom of darkness. Too good to be true news? Yeah, maybe. We can think that. Or maybe this good news doesn't really inspire or wake you up because the story doesn't really align with 
what I've already determined for where I'm headed in, in life. And some of our reactions as we hear this, some of these reactions come from our, our distorted view of who God is. At times, the scriptures can be like a Rorschach test or like those ink blots. You know, and you, you hold up the picture and it's like a weird design and then you're, you're supposed to interpret uh, what you see. And as you're, as you're looking at that image, it actually says more about where you are and what's happening in your mind than it does about what's being written in the text. Because a lot of times, whatever we want to find in the scripture, we can actually find it. And oftentimes, we have a way of projecting our own brokenness onto how we view God. We can bring our own baggage in trying to uncover what God is really like. I know there's, there's many more categories, but I'm going to break down three, I think, that are, that are most common. I know for myself, I've kind of gone in between one of these three in many different times of how I view and, and picture who God is and what he's like. But the first most common uh, view is God is a cosmic vending machine, would be one way to put it. This idea, if I say the right prayer in the right order and I press the right buttons, that, that God will dispense of the thing that I'm most uh, looking for, the thing that, I, the thing that I'm, I need most in my life. This is the God that's almost like, a, like a, a heavenly Santa Claus where I just need to present my list of the things that I want and then if I'm good enough, then he'll bring them to me. This is the God that gives his kids whatever they want, regardless of how poorly they behave. Uh, the God that makes sure that I'll get that parking space that I'm looking for. Or, or that sale, I just want it to last. God, please, let it last just a couple more days, right? I just want that thing to still be there for me. At worst, it turns God into a means to my desired end. Where the relationship is nothing more than a way to get the things that I want. And that my, my faith serves nothing more than, than a vehicle to help further my own way of living. It's a, it's a disposition that's, that's very uh, focused on, on self. I like to call it like meocentric, right? Like where I'm, I'm the, the main character of every story, of every situation. Everything revolves around me and my way of coming to God. But this all-powerful, all-loving Gracious God, we, we treat him kind of like, we see him almost like a, like a handbag or an accessory that matches the rest of our outfit. And this view, um, a response to this view can actually swing the pendulum too far in another direction. If we've got the cosmic vending machine who's just there to serve us and to do whatever the, it is that we feel like we, we need him to do and whatever we want, the other extreme going down the, uh, on the other, the other side of the, the scale would be the, the absentee landlord, would be a way, to, a way to put it. A God that's abandoned me. A God that has little to no power to help me in a way that's substantial or important. Yeah, I believe that he's there, but he's not interested in the things of my life. And I wouldn't, he's probably too busy. Why would I even bother him with the things that I've got going on? It comes with a heavy doubt that God has any desire to intervene in my life. And this belief compels me to rely on my self-effort and my own strength. This kind of God, the one that's so far and so distant, makes my prayers weak and non-expectant if they happen at all. With the cosmic vending machine, we say, give me more. But with this depiction of the, the absentee landlord, we don't even ask. Even though the scripture says we're encouraged to come boldly before God and to present him with all of our requests. So both extremes aren't healthy for us. They're not, they're not the place where we need to be. Which leads to our, our final uh, distorted image that sometimes we, we carry when we think about God. And that's the, the angry judge. 
This is the, the bloodthirsty Zeus-like character that sits on a throne with maybe a hammer in one hand and a lightning bolt in the other, uh, ready to cast judgment and punishment for anybody that steps out of line. If you don't do the right thing, then you're out. And this God, this, this version or this distorted image of God fills me with fear and guilt and shame. And I'm often thinking about the things that I've done wrong. I feel trapped by them. I feel shame. I feel as though I can never measure up. How can I be enough? And then by default, I'll often scoff at the idea of anyone else being able to meet that standard and to live up to what God's expectations are. So a heart of judgmentalism will creep in and say, well, if I can't do it, then how can anybody else? And I start to poke uh, holes and flaws in the way that people are living. None of these images get the right picture of what our God is like. So we need a grounding, a consistent lens that helps us get centered on who God is a little more clearly. This right understanding of who God is helps us to interpret the scripture. Instead of us projecting our own hurt or brokenness, it actually gives us the lens that we're able to see clearly. I love the story in the end of uh, Luke's gospel where after Jesus' resurrection, he's walking with the two unsuspecting followers and they're just, just, just talking about what's happened recently and how Jesus has, has died and they don't know he's resurrected yet. They're talking and they're breaking down the Old Testament. And throughout their conversation, they're coming to the understanding that all of the scriptures point to Jesus. And it's, it's the lens in which that they're able to, to make sense of the Bible that they're reading. Jesus doesn't get his meaning from the symbols, but the symbols derive their meaning from Jesus. To know what God is like, we look to Jesus. Jesus himself says it in John 14, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The passage that we've read this morning in Colossians says this, that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. To know what God is like, we look to Jesus. To know what God is like, we look to Jesus. This is not the, the vending machine, the absentee landlord, the judge. We look to Jesus to see what God is like. And in Jesus, we see all of the things that we identified in this new kingdom. We see love and compassion. We see empathy. We see other-centeredness. We see faith. We see self-sacrifice. This is what God is like. God is like Jesus. It is nothing like the pagan gods of force or coercion. This is nothing like Egypt or Babylon. This is not empire. This God is love. God is not like Pharaoh. He's not like Caiaphas. He's not like Pilate. He's not like Caesar. He's nothing like Zeus. But this God is love, and this God's love is put on display most graphically on the cross. The cross is where this, this image is most powerful and most meaningful. We read uh, the next chapter over in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Paul goes on to say, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And we've seen it with this story of evil and sin trying to thwart God's plan from the very beginning. 
When we look through the Old Testament, we see the many instances where the bloodline of Christ was only one heartbeat away from being completely destroyed. And how the time of Jesus' birth, even Herod, he orders all of the babies of a certain age to be wiped out in the area in order to, to, to stifle the prophecy of the coming king. And with the crucifixion of Jesus, I love how a uh, New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright, puts it. He describes it as the, the crucifixion, as somehow all of the evil of the world being lured into one place. And that the cross is the single place where this culmination of all evil and wickedness is gathering, almost like a storm cloud. But it's on the cross where the forces and kingdom of darkness thought that it was going to have its way. But the cross deals with it completely. All of our sin, all of our violence, all of our hatred, Jesus takes it and deals with it. And we know that this is true. We know that it's dealt with because three days later, what happens? He defeats death. And what if the cross, as we've, maybe some of us have come to understand, it isn't the picture of a wrathful God wanting to find someone to punish. But instead, it's a picture of a loving God that is willing to endure the sin and violence that we create in order to set us free from the things that get in our way. God didn't hate the world so much that he punished his only son. But God loved our world and everything in it so much that he gave his son to free us from condemnation. He did this to close the gap. The song we sang earlier is that he, he, he tore the veil that keeps us apart, that creates distance. The cross removes the things that are wedged deep in our hearts that keep us in a kingdom of darkness and instead move us towards this kingdom of light. This is saying to all people that the sacrificial system that you've been participating in, the animal sacrifices, the pilgrimages, the, all of these things are, are no longer necessary. That this act of self-sacrificial love means that they no longer had to participate and that the resurrection means that this news, good news is available to all of us as well. I'll read one more, one more passage of Scripture before we close, and that's uh, in 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 7 to 12. As I read this, I want you to pick out what, what you think, the, the, if you had to pick one word, one theme word from this passage, I want you to listen carefully and, and discern if you can. Um, what, that, what that word would be. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, and whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son, into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Can I get an amen? Okay. Did you pick out the theme? Is there a word that pops out? Is there a word that maybe resonated? Love. John, Paul, and all of the gospel writers understand that the sacrifice for our sins was an outrageous act of love. God is not angry with us. He does not want to kill us, but what God wants to show his love for us. 
It means that our entire lives do not have to be a pleading for God to do something for us. He's done it already. Our, our, our lives don't have to be a constant please, please, please. But our lives can instead be a thank you, a life of gratitude. How can I serve? How can I love? How can I be a good representation? This is the invitation to live, live lives like God did when he came to earth to introduce this upside-down kind of kingdom that shames the power of darkness, that turns the way of Egypt and empire completely upside-down on its head. I says, no, we're not a people of power and force and violence, but we're a people of self-sacrifice and empathy and compassion and love. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are, you are our example, yes, but so much more than that. What you did for us so many years ago still has power and influence and impact today. That if we choose to receive You offer to take all of our sin, all of the things that get in our, our way from being the people that you've created us to be. So God, I pray that you would um, give us the courage to respond in a way that takes us to that place. of representing you well, of actually being your dwelling place here on earth. Bless us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can, I'd love for you to stand with me before we, uh, we say our, our goodbyes. We're going to have some time of musical worship. Just like to bless you. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make us complete in everything good, so that we may do God's will through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.